Hello, everyone. I am Ala Marchenko, uh, president of the Aurora Philosophy Institute. Our speaker this evening is API associate Henry Chosowski, who will be presenting the topic Schopenhauer, the world as will and representation, part one. Arthur Schopenhauer was a German idealist philosopher whose work was very influential in intellectual and artistic circles in Europe in the 19th century. This presentation will be in two parts. Tonight, Henry will be introducing Schopenhauer's very dark and pessimistic vision from his major work. Next time, there might be a little more optimistic slant when Henry will explore some of Schopenhauer's strategies escaping from the will. If you are watching on our YouTube channel, please subscribe, make comments, and press the like button. And if you really like it, I should mention that on the channel and on the API website, there is a voluntary donate button. Any contribution, no matter how large or small, will be greatly appreciated. Welcome, Henry. Um, before coming to the actual presentation, I'd like to present a disclaimer that uh, during the presentation, no opinions with respect to Mr. Schopenhauer are being expressed. The goal is to solely highlight the main points of his work and uh, uh, this is presentation neither supports nor criticizes this philosophy. Okay, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer was a German philosopher, mostly known as the proponent of the metaphysical doctrine of the will in immediate reaction against Hegelian idealism. His work hasn't achieved substantial attention during his life. However, it has subsequently impacted the development of various disciplines, including philosophy, psychology, literature, and science. The work as will and representation, written between uh, 1818 and 1859, and published in three editions, was considered to be the highest point of Schopenhauer's philosophical thought. This particular book has been preceded by a doctoral dissertation on the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, which Schopenhauer regarded as the introduction to his magnum focus. This work has appeared in the initial response to the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant and then developed into Schopenhauer's own metaphysical doctrine. The first decades, after his publication was met with mere silence. Exceptions were Goethe and Jean Paul, on which Schopenhauer commented, in my opinion, the praise of one man of genius fully makes good the neglect of a thoughtless multitude. Schopenhauer presents the world as it shown itself to us through objects organized by space, time, and by cause and effect relationships, according to the principle of sufficient reason. However, he claims that the world is ruled by a will, a blind natural force. Not merely that the world exists, but still more that it is such a miserable and melancholy world is the tormenting problem of metaphysics. Schopenhauer identifies the thing in itself, the inner essence of everything as will, a blind, unconscious, striving, unstoppable force. He calls it as well demonic force outside of space and time. When we direct our awareness in the world, 
we would discover at the core of our being an unconscious instinct of force characterized by a restless striving. This force at the core of our being is a powerful will. Will for life is the most real of all things that we know, indeed the core of reality itself. Schopenhauer proposed that we can clearly intuit the raw desire or instinct, the will within us during the sexual act, or when our survival instincts are activated. He called it the will to live. What will aims at and achieves in human beings is indeed essentially no more than its good, its goal in animals, nourishment, and propagation. But through the organization of the human beings, the requirements of achievement of their goal were so greatly enhanced that an enhancement of the intellect was necessary. The lower a man is an in intellectual respect, the less puzzling and mysterious existence is to him. On the contrary, Everything, how it is and that it is, seems to him a matter of course. Schopenhauer did not envision that his philosophy would attract the masses. Instead, he realized that for most individuals, the world's existence is not a mystery at all. Upon reading Kant, Schopenhauer underwent what he called an intellectual rebirth and put the Kant's core ideas in the foundation upon which he built his own philosophical house. Schopenhauer's interpretation of Kant was that space, time, and causality do not exist in the world, but are instead features of our mind, which it uses to construct our experience, basically an illusion. If accordingly we attempt to imagine an objective world without a knowing subject, then we become aware that what we are, what we are imagining at that moment, is in truth the opposite of what we intended, namely nothing but just a process in the intellect of a knowing being who perceives an objective world. I have to mention that there is no unified opinion as to whether Kant actually meant that these principles were features of the mind. However, this is how Schopenhauer interpreted it. Our world is driven by a fundamentally dissatisfied will, continually seeking satisfaction. Proceeding from the transcendental idealism of Kant, Schopenhauer developed an atheistic, metaphysical, and ethical system considered a manifestation of philosophical. Pessimism. According to Schopenhauer, only aesthetic experiences can free a person briefly from his endless servitude to the will, which is the root of suffering. According to Schopenhauer, only aesthetic experiences can free a person briefly from his endless servitude to the will, which is Schopenhauer philosophy insists that all nature both organic and non-organic, is the expression of an insatiable will. Desire for more, manifested by the will, is what causes human suffering. What we discover when we look closely at our wills is that they are governed not by a reason, but by impulse, and at its most fundamental level, a dark, dull driver. And even at its highest, most clarified level, Still desires masked by creative power. Every satisfaction he attains lays the seeds of some new desire, for there is no end to the wishes of each individual will. Schopenhauer pointed out that anything outside of time and space could not be differentiated. So that thing in itself must be one. All things that exist, including human beings, must be part of this fundamental unit. 
plurality exists and has become possible only through time and space defined by our sense. The will as thing in itself lies outside of the principle of sufficient reason, in particular time, space, and causality. Human capacity for cognition is subordinate to the demands of the will, hence the cause of suffering. Schopenhauer presents a pessimistic picture of which unfulfilled desires are painful, and once the pain is removed, pleasure can be experienced. However, most desires are never fulfilled, and those that are fulfilled are instantly replaced by more unfulfilled ones. Its desires are unlimited, its claims inexhaustible, and every satisfied desire gives birth to a new one. No possible satisfaction in the world could suffice to steal its craving, set a final goal to its demands, and fill the bottomless pit of its heart. Being unable to achieve the lasting happiness and joy upon attaining our goals, Schopenhauer declares that the sensation of being free from the suffering associated with endless desires won't last. And when this happens, the dreadful burden of hopelessness takes over. With no desires or goals to keep us in the state of striving, we no longer expect that happiness awaits and we submit to anxiety and despair. We cannot feel happiness, but we can feel pain, either physical or mental. And only feeling pain, we can appreciate the painless state and classified as heavy. The principal source of the most serious ills that afflict the human being is human beings themselves, homo hominis lupus. Since organisms must feed another organisms to nourish themselves, and all organisms are manifestation of will, Schopenhauer concluded, the will must live on itself, but there exists nothing beside it, and it is a hungry will. As manifestation of will, we are condemned to a life of misery, pain, and suffering. And according to Schopenhauer, there remains only one thing we can do if we are to find any semblance of peace in this miserable earth we must escape from the world. As a rule, injustice, extreme unfairness, carelessness, cruelty, characterize people's conduct towards one another. The opposite occurs only as an exception. All winning springs from lack, from deficiency, and thus from suffering. When we desire something, we do so from a state of deficiency, wanting something we do not have. Not having something we want implies we are dissatisfied with our current condition. It implies that we are suffering from the pain of longing for something that is not in ours. Under the power of delusion, we believe that once we attain that which we desire, we will be satisfied with our life. However, when we get that, we crave what we crave, we experience merely an anticlimactic feeling of being released from our previous state of suffering. In other words, the satisfaction felt upon fulfilling a desire is not positive, but negative, meaning that it is nothing but the elimination of a prior pain to be replaced with a new one. All satisfaction of what one commonly calls happiness is really and essentially always only negative and never at all positive. It is not a gratification that comes to us originally and of itself, but must always be the satisfaction of desire. The only way to escape the burden ridden by despair is to choose 
new goals. And again, to assume the delusional belief that their attainment will bring us lasting happiness. And so goes the life of all humans, slaves to the will, the brutal force at the core of everything. Nothing other can be stated as the purpose of our existence than cognizance. Cognizance of the fact that it would be better that we not exist. This comes from the concept of life and suffering. Hence, what is the point of living at all? Schopenhauer realized that it is not our intellect that best expressed the real nature of the will, but our genitals. It is well known that following the lead of one's genitals ends in disappointment, frustration, to which a desire ultimately leads. Either one goes, Either, either, either one does, does not get the object of desire, or is frustrated. Or one does, but then one wants more. And either does not get it, or is frustrated. Or does, but then wants more. And so on. We can never truly satisfy desire, but there is nothing else we can do under the power of will. Although we can at best attempt to escape from the clutches, of the world, whether to art, ascetism, or compassion. Schopenhauer thought that our body was a manifestation of will, for that our body is presented to us in the form of representation, and our will is presented via direct inner experience. Since he proposed that we can intuit the raw design, which is the will within us, during the sexual life, and when our survival was in Japan, he also called it a will to live. Things are understood in relation to each other in space and time and according to cause and effect. No truth is more certain than this one. That everything existing for cognition is only an object in relation to a subject. The being of an object in general belongs to the form of appearance and is conditioned by the being of the subject in general, just as the object's manner of appearance is conditioned by the subject forms of knowledge. Hence, if the thing in itself is to be assumed, it cannot be an object at all. If the underlying nature of reality, the thing in itself, is nothing other than will, then escape from it should not really be possible, but should only be recognized. He presents his epistemological premise that we can know ultimate reality through knowing ourselves, and reaches an ontological conclusion that ultimate reality must be like ourselves. But in opposition to German idealists, he assumes that our own nature is essentially non-rational. And therefore, the ultimate character of our reality is also fundamentally non-rational. From the start, the intellect is a higher hand assigned to a miserable task at which its overly demanding master, the will, keeps it busy from morning until night. Schopenhauer argues that the world which humans experience around them, the world of objects in space and time following the cause and effect pattern, exists solely as representation, dependent on our cognition, our intellect not as the real world that exists in itself, meaning independently of how it appears to the subject mind. We apprehend object in conjunction with our relations to them. So we are cognizant of ideas of things, merely relations. To step out and apprehend things as they are, you must consider things without personal involvement under complete silencing of the world, if it's possible. 
our world is a product of our perception. So one's knowledge of object is thus knowledge of mere phenomena rather than things in themselves. Intellect is a tool of our brain that produces thoughts, allows abstract thinking, and serves as a faculty of cognition. In fact, the intellect is a mere function of the brain. The will, by contrast, that whose function is the entire human being with respect to his, to his being and essence. Schopenhauer is often saying that empowered intellect is a means to escape from the clutches of the will. The purpose of all intelligence is only reaction to will. But because all willing is liberation, the nullification of all willing is the ultimate work of that intellect, which has served its purpose up until then. Then the empowered intellect can stop being a tool of the will, paving the way to liberation. However, at the same time, even the most complete intelligence possible can only be a transitional step toward that which no cognizance at all can ever reach. On the path of objective knowledge, thus starting from the representation, we shall never get beyond the representation, meaning the phenomenon. We shall therefore remain at the outside of things. We shall never be able to penetrate into their inner nature and investigate what they are in themselves. The concept of representation can be interpreted as a perception of an object by a subject or an idea. Actually, presentation of an object at the stage of our own mind. Now, if space, time, and causality are features of the mind, then it follows that the object of the world depends on the mind for their existence. And the world, as we know it, is just a representation created by our mind. Schopenhauer famously expressed this idealist position by proclaiming, the world is my representation. Therefore, intellect shares the demise of the body, states Schopenhauer. If this human existence were not pessimistic enough, Schopenhauer put the final stamp in it, the mark of unavoidable tragedy. For unlike all other animals who are slaves to the present moment, we are aware that what awaits us after this miserable life of striving and suffering is the utter annihilation of our individual being. <laughs> that itself is a sea full of rocks, rocks and whirlpools that man avoids with the greatest caution and care. Also, he knows that even when he succeeds with all his efforts and ingenuity in struggling through, at every step he comes near to the greatest, the total, the inevitable shipwreck, namely death. This is the final goal of the very some voyage. What makes death so frightful to us is not so much the end of life, since this cannot seem to anyone particularly worth regretting, but rather the destruction of the organism. Despite the resemblance of his ideas to the Eastern philosophy, he did not believe in life after death, and to him, the concept of individual souls is just a representation of the will. If you view life as full of pointless sufferings, then who could define the purpose of life? According to Schopenhauer, it is a product of blind natural forces, he named will. However, to provide a questionable consolation, he writes, living being does not suffer an absolute annihilation through death, but survives 
in and with the whole of nature. Well, uh, if this you can serve as a consolation for them. Schopenhauer discusses suicide at length, noting that it does not actually destroy the will or any part of it, since death is merely the end of one particular phenomenon of the will. He saw the violent suicide in some sense an affirmation of the will. Our life is in the first instance like a payment that gets doled out to us in nothing but pains, but for which we must then give a receipt. Our life is the days, the receipt is death. For in the end, time pronounces nature's verdict on the votes of all the beings appealing in it by destroying them. He considered life as a burden, never perfect, never allowing us to fully free our mind of things that trouble us and create discontent. At the same time, we are not as such aware of the three greatest goods of life. So life indeed has some goods. Health, youth, and freedom. So long as you possess them, but only after you have lost them. What might otherwise be called the final part of life, its purest joy, just because it lifts us out of real existence and transforms us into disinterested spectators of it. This pure knowledge, pleasure in a beautiful, genuine delight in art, which remains foreign to all willing. Although Schopenhauer thought that life as a whole is futile by the fact that it's filled with suffering and ends in death, he did admit that certain ecstatic and highly meaningful moments can drive us from our normal state of misery into a blissful state of mind. Such euphoric experiences arise when we contemplate a beautiful piece of art, a spectacular natural landscape, or an excellent piece of music. Whereas to the ordinary man, his faculty of knowledge is a lamp that lights his past to the man of genius. It is the sound that reveals the world. Consequently, a way from within stands open to us to that real inner nature of things to which we cannot in trade from without. So, uh, continuation, which gives us some hope that we can sometime, someday escape from the will, is the part two. The part one is over.